Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started as it is 12 o'clock and we have a hard stop at one o'clock today. So um, my name is Elise Durbin. I am one of the APA Minnesota's professional development officer and you are on APA Minnesota's January Knowledge at Noon webinar. Our topic today is the planning process as an economic development tool. So a little bit about our presentation today. Even prior to the COVID pandemic, planning departments across the world were modernizing their processes to serve their customers and truly engage our communities in what is happening in our backyards. Today, you'll hear about the city of Ramsey and what they have done to leverage technology as well as balancing their staff resources um, through both city staff and consulting planners to reduce its plan review time by 50% without adding significant additional resources. These investments in technology and professional development for staff have led to dramatic improvements in customer service satisfaction. If you walk away with one lesson from the session, it is design, it is to design your process around the customer experience and not your organization chart. While the session focuses primarily on current planning activities, the foundation of the success is based upon the city's long range vision, and they use that as a lens for their development review. See how the city of Ramsey was able to amplify the technology enhancements and professional development investments previously made prior to the pandemic to be able to quickly transition to the telecommuting environment without missing a beat. In addition, the city of Ramsey was able to design a successful hybrid environment and keep their community engaged in a major project. So our presenter today is Tim Gladhill. Tim is currently the Deputy City Administrator for the City of Ramsey. As part of his role as primary backup to the City Administrator and Project Manager for a number of key projects. Tim also serves as the community's Community Development Director, providing leadership to planning, economic and building inspections. This is Tim's 20th year associated with the city of Ramsey, originally serving as public works maintenance worker. In addition to his professional role, Tim has volunteered to give back to the planning community for nearly 10 years. Uh, just recently, Tim wrapped up his ninth year on the APA Minnesota Board of Directors serving as president from 2017 to 2020. In addition, Tim holds a leadership position at APA National, serving as the chapter president liaison to the AICP Commission. Tim holds a dual bachelor's of science degree in geography and urban studies from Minnesota State University in Mankato, and a master's degree in geographic information science with a minor in public policy from the University of Minnesota. Additionally, Tim is AICP certified. So with that, I have a few housekeeping notes before I turn it over to Tim. Please make sure your microphones are on mute. This session has been approved for one CM credit. Uh, the presentation will go for about 45 minutes and the last 15 minutes today will be for Q&A. If you have questions for the presenter, put them in the chat box at any time and we will uh, answer those questions there at the end of the session. Uh, once it, uh, the session is completed in the future, we will be uh, emailing out to you uh, a survey seeking your feedback on this session as well as new topics. And by the way, we are always looking for presenters. So if you have a topic that you want to share on. Additionally, we are recording this video. So if you'd like to go back and watch that at a future time, you may be able to. Uh, so thanks again for attending, and with that, I will turn it over to Tim. Uh, thank you, Elise. Thank you for allowing to be here. Um, start off a new year um, and uh, continue some great planning that's definitely happening around Minnesota, uh, but uh, much throughout the country as well. Um, great to see so many people signed up today, not only from Minnesota, but for, uh, through some other states as well. Uh, so we get to talk about the many great things that are happening in the state of Minnesota um, and break about the great planning group that we have here. So as I go through my presentation, Elise alluded to, um, I'm Tim Gladhill. I've been working with the 
uh, city of Ramsey in various capacities for nearly two decades now. So I literally started out of high school as a public works maintenance worker, did that full time for a little bit. And I'll kind of explain how that led me to the planning profession. Um, unfortunately, I didn't grow up knowing that I wanted to be a planner. I found it. Um, I found it to be very exciting. Um, so I know that's a story that plays out with uh, many of us in the profession. So Ramsey of Minnesota itself, uh, the city, not the county, we get plenty of calls for Ramsey County where uh, they are seated in the city of St. Paul. So often confused with Ramsey County, but um, a distinctly different group um, in a different uh, community. A fast growing community as well. Uh, we're at about 28,000, 29,000 eagerly awaiting the results of the 2020 census. Um, if you look back over the past two decades, uh, we've added nearly uh, 10,000 people to our population. And so um, great growth, um, a lot of stress in our infrastructure. Um, we could go on a number of presentations of many great things that are occurring in Ramsey. About 7,000 employees and growing. Last year alone, we added about 300,000 square feet of new commercial industrial space. Uh, we are Northwestern suburban community. Um, of Minneapolis and so uh, seeing a lot of great changes despite being um, uh, about a half hour out from Minneapolis itself. Second fastest growing community in Anoka County and we see about 150 new households per year on average, sometimes at 75, sometimes at 300. Um, so it's a very dynamic uh, community in its growth and preservation of our rural character on top of that. Uh, one of our, our shining examples is being part of the North Star commuter rail. Uh, we are actually an infill station. We were not part of the original uh, our commuter line. We were able to be the only infill or secondary station that was added after the original institution of North Star commuter rail. Um, we have a good balance of commercial industrial growth along with predominantly single family. Uh, but we've seen a lot of variety of housing um, ranging from single family to multifamily over the past decade or so. So a little bit about my experience and the lens that I bring to this discussion. Uh, Elise mentioned it earlier on. I serve as the deputy city administrator, uh, but it's been a long ladder to climb since I've been there. Um, starting in 2000, I was hired on as a public works maintenance worker. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. I thought maybe I wanted to be a high school band teacher. That was my passion in high school. Um, that quickly pivoted um, and Ramsey really uh, set the foundation for that. As I started to understand how cities work um, and see how they change over time, I transitioned. I went to Minnesota State Mankato, finished that up at the University of Minnesota, uh, came on as a planning and management intern, worked my way through the planning uh, department here at the city of Ramsey, ultimately up to community development director and adding uh, the deputy city administrator as part of that. Um, and uh, yes, I've been very fortunate to be volunteering a lot through APA Minnesota and APA National, so get involved. So the lens that I look through this presentation, um, I've done variations of this presentation to broker uh, groups and lots of other economic development style uh, associations. Um, it's something that's resonated well. Started out as a little bit of a joke, a hokey saying, but we just got to find that path to yes. If a project is something that's going to advance your vision, let's make sure that the process gets out of the way. The process is important to what we do. Uh, we want to make sure that those projects are high in quality and advance our vision. But once we've established that, um, how do we make our process as efficient and accurate as possible? So um, I think it was our HR manager that picked up on uh, this phrase that I was using a lot as we were recruiting new employees to our group. So we were always trying to find that path to us to give the council the opportunity to either approve or not approve a project. We didn't want staff to get in the way. I refined this method a little bit over time um, because I realized that many people were reacting to well what if it's a project that doesn't isn't what the council wants so I'll get into why the long-range plan is so important to what we do because that serves as the foundation I'm not sure what my favorite tagline to go attach to this is uh, to really better explain this but um, our role are in as planners in this are it's either a tour guide that helps us through that process uh, to make sure that we help our customers through what is actually a very complex, sometimes very confusing process. So is it a tour guide? Is it a conductor of an orchestra bringing all of the different elements 
of the city's organization together to be singing, playing together in that unified voice, I think both have some merit in what we do here too. So, you know, these might be a little bit folky of phrases to use, um, but it really establishes a culture within our organization. And it's been important for us uh, to really think about it in fun and creative ways. So I mentioned the long range plan and our, or in Minnesota, what we refer to as our comprehensive plan, 20 year land use vision uh, that we have to, at least in the metro area, update once every 10 years. Uh, we're just coming off of that cycle, uh, that regional planning cycle has reset and we'll start to look at the next cycle. Um, as I was giving these presentations, one of the main feedbacks, I, pieces of feedback that I did receive is, well, our council doesn't want to see each and every project that comes forward to you, and that is correct. And so we added this layer to the lens that was our vision, our long range vision um, is what establishes it. And so oftentimes it's really easy to see that it meets your vision, um, and that being, does it comply with your zoning code, that checklist? Um, what we found was there were a lot of creative projects that maybe needed a zoning amendment or some sort of discretionary action for, from the council. Um, and we started to ask the question, well, are there different ways to achieve that same vision so our plan can be flexible, nimble, and adaptable to new technology and creative projects? So that's another lens that I think is really important as we look at the detail of this presentation. Uh, so the plan itself, what we found, if we explain it well uh, to our applicants, is that it provides uh, certainty. Um, and certainty reduces risk, and that in turn reduces cost to the developer. And so if, if we explain why we're approaching the process in the way we are, developers actually really like that. I have yet to have a developer that says they don't like what we're doing. They want to know that the council is supporting the concept behind what we're doing before they do detailed engineering plans, which can be tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And little tweaks to that or little amendments can have uh, literally $10,000 worth of work uh, to revise those plans. I think we take that for granted. And again, make sure your plan and your process allows for change and adaption. Um, in Minnesota, in the metro area, we are amending our plans, updating our plans once every 10 years. Um, but I think Ramsey still might hold the record for amendments between those two 10 years. Uh, we're able to react to really creative projects that add value to the community. So as we move into um, the, the plan itself and how we implement that plan, I'm gonna change views here just a second. Um, and the importance of uh, this to what we do is we implement the plan through our development review process. And that in itself has become an economic development tool. Um, having certainty and having a streamlined process that is reliable and accurate um, has been really important for enticing good development to come here, whether it's commercial, industrial, or residential. And what's unique about Ramsey, um, it might not be unique for all communities, but in a situation such as Ramsey, we actually started to find ourselves in the role as developer in addition to regulator. And that really came to be where, as we unfolded our brand new downtown area plan, uh, Ramsey lacked a downtown. We were trying to establish our identity, and so we wanted to create this downtown. Um, and this vision came in the, the late 1990s and continues to progress over time. Um, plan became reality, became development and infrastructure in the ground. And that all came with the previous recession in 2008, where we started to see some momentum. And unfortunately, the master development that was over 300 acres got locked up into foreclosure. Um, the, the bank that was leading this effort to foreclosure involved over 20 banks, um, and we wanted to preserve that downtown vision. We didn't want to see it fire sailed and just become another traditional suburban development. So we stepped in and purchased half of that land, 150 acres. And so instantly, not only were we the city in traditional terms and not just doing scattered site redevelopment, we were developers of 150 acres and we needed to um, maybe compete with some adjacent communities that were a little bit more well-established. And so that provided us with a whole new perspective on our development review process, uh, just to give you a little con context of where we are today. So what we found was by thinking through that lens of developer and maybe kind of the view that they typically do and think about the process as the applicant versus the org chart, 
uh, we found that we were saving time in the long run. Maybe some of the initial steps early on were taking longer and there were additional steps than what we had seen in the past. When we would provide that entire schedule and to give some confidence to the developer on when can they get their permit, they really like that. So you have to look at this in the totality of the sum of the parts, not just the individual steps uh, to get there. So as we look through that lens, I kind of alluded to this already. What the applicant looks at is, when can I get my permit? Um, it really comes down to that. And so with many developments, we've had lots of debates about um, ins and outs of plan review and schedules and this and that. Um, and sometimes near the end, that discussion gets incredibly tense. And then as soon as we issue that permit, all that tension is released. Uh, so we started to think about, all right, when can, on average, when can we issue a permit for this project? And we start to back up from there and lay out the entire schedule. Um, and you'll see some of the pre-application steps that we do. Uh, so starting from that as a starting point, working backwards has been really successful laying out the schedule. Um, and again, providing certainty to the developer throughout the process. If you look at it from the org chart perspective, you know, a permit comes in from an applicant, okay, there's a review coordinator, we gather all the stuff, you know, maybe it's 15 copies of plans that need to be distributed, maybe it's walking plan sets to different plan reviewers for review. Um, we go make sure that everything is there and complete. Uh, we use a lot of planning jargon in what we do. Um, and then finally, when it's at the end of the queue, there needs to be markup, we send it back and they're at the end of the line, they have to start over. Um, that was a really inefficient way for us to go about that. And I just want to repeat the use of the planning jargon phrase here. Um, we've worked really hard to just use plain language. I have borrowed um, some stuff from the Minnesota DNR. We did a big initiative of just use plain language. Talk like an applicant, talk like a developer, don't talk like a planner or an engineer. Some of that planning jargon can provide confusion um, as well as frustration to the developer. Those are important, but those are more internal discussions. Um, again, we really try to put ourselves in the shoes of the applicants as they walk through the process. And getting back to that concept of a tour guide, that's what our planners are really here to do. They're here to hold the hand of the developer or of the applicant um, and really kind of coach them through the process try to anticipate the roadblocks and let them know, hey, this is coming up, we will help you get through that. We are an advocate for your project. So communication is really key to what we do here. Um, and again, uh, I'll, I'll speak to this a little bit more in a second, but um, I think too often, at least in our experience, is we finish plan review, we send the applicant comments, they're asked to review those comments and revise. It comes back in, but all of a sudden it's at the back of the line and they have to wait two more weeks uh, to get comments on the revised plan set. So we try to prioritize a little bit. We try to put some metrics around initial plan review versus revised plan review. And I'll share some of those metrics with you in a second. So the metrics that we try to do, and this provides some certainty to our applicants, when it comes to building permits, standard plan review within two weeks, complex commercial plan review, four weeks, uh, land use applications are a little bit different. In the last slide, I talked about initial plan review versus revised. Um, we do try to get our revised plans a little bit quicker and even towards the tail end of the project when we know it's about to start construction and there's just one or two comments left, we're not going to make them wait another two weeks. So there's some discretion within here as well. And then in terms of the communication, really stress upon staff, you get a phone call, um, they leave a voicemail or email, respond that same day. Um, even if it is nothing more than saying, hey, I got your inquiry, I got your voicemail, we are looking into it, and we'll try to get you resolution within 48 hours. Um, find that our applicants really don't like it when they don't know if anybody has received their voicemail. Uh, so we've tried to establish that culture of same day response, even if it's not a final answer, just acknowledgement that their, their request was received by an actual person, not just an auto response from an email or something that was stated in our voicemail. So as we think about uh, some lessons learned here, and if I were to try to simplify what's gonna be a little bit more of a complex uh, presentation here in just a second, there's really two things I've learned in my time here overseeing the development review process. First and foremost, developers hate surprises. Uh, so you'll see some strategies that we've been doing on the front end, just to lay out all the cards on the table before they apply, before they go to planning commission, it might feel like a lot, 
Um, but having that certainty of knowing what to expect and avoiding any perceived su surprises um, has really bode well for us. We used to get hundreds of comments of negative uh, customer service ratings pre kind of a major overhaul of our review process. And now it's generally fairly silent, uh, which is actually a good thing. We're not getting those complaints, whether it's formal surveys or just informal feedback. I'm not saying we're perfect. There are times where we exceed our metrics um, and we do get some negative feedback, but by and large, uh, we have gotten rave reviews from our developers going through this process. Um, again, it takes some explanation of what to expect um, and the totality of the project and when can they get that permit for them to really appreciate what we're attempting to doing. So if I think about this in an economic development lens, and as I have moved from planning uh, manager uh, over to community development director and getting more involved in economic development, um, that was a really good learning experience for me to think about how development uh, goes about the site selection process. And it's really about eliminating uncertainty. So on this slide, uh, we have an example of a tool that Greater MSP, the Regional Economic Development Agency here in the metro area, um, their request for information, something they push out, we've got this prospect, they're looking for a community, you know, respond. And it's all about trying to check as many of these boxes as you can to eliminate that uncertainty in a project. Is it shovel ready? Uh, can I build a project this year or next year? Um, and so I've tried to use this framework and what we do in the planning side. And again, that was that pivot point from the planning tool being that required development review process that developers don't necessarily want to go through to becoming an economic development tool. So we use this process to eliminate certainty in a very strategic manner um, that we don't have to start with construction plans only to find out that the council doesn't support the project and tens of thousands of dollars of design work has gone for not. Um, so again, I've used this as kind of a new framework to think about uh, the planning process, at least in terms of the development review process. Um, part two is sometimes um, a streamlined review will make a decision between two communities and where a business is going to relocate. So this is a little bit more focused on site plan approval of a commercial industrial building as opposed to a large residential subdivision. Obviously we can't do a major subdivision in 45 to 60 days, but if we have a shovel ready site um, and if there's a difference between 45 days and 60 days, businesses actually make decisions based off of that short of a turnaround time because they have a lot of other things. Maybe they have to sell another building, they have a contingent offer on their previous building. Uh, there's an internal corporate process for them to approve a project and you know, time is money for a lot of these projects. Um, I also want to emphasize that speed is important, but also accuracy. So getting back to uh, my comments about um, no surprises, uh, making sure that we can do it faster, but still do it actually increase accuracy to what we were doing in the past. So um, I will admit that I've kind of borrowed this concept from my colleagues at Brooklyn Park. Um, several years ago, there was an article in the Star Tribune or a local newspaper that talked about why did this big major corporation locate on the 610 corridor? And one of the reasons that they phrased was one community said they can get it done in 60 days and Brooklyn Park said they could do it in 45 and they delivered. Um, so those are real decision making points and why I think that I have phrased this whole presentation as the planning process as an economic development tool. Little trade secret, you'll hear from developers quite a bit that you know sometimes permit fees and development fees are a deciding factor um, and sometimes that might be, but more often than not, it's really not, not about the local government fees. It's about predictability and speed in your review process. So um, again, you know, using a streamlined and accurate review process as you try to actually recruit uh, projects, and we've used our schedule and how we try to streamline things to actually recruit prospects successfully in our process. So again, uh, not just the dollars and cents because each community is relatively same as it relates to permit fees and development fees. Sometimes it's the process that can uh, push a project over the edge. So to talk about the technology enhancements we've made in a traditional plan review approach, um, I first wanna talk about that traditional process before we get into electronic plan review. Uh, so in the past, at least, and this is kind of an oversimplification of it, and this really plays out more in permits the land use applications. 
Um, in Ramsey, our experience was the plans, two sets of plans went to the planner first, um, and it might sit on my desk for three to five days before I even got to it. Then we would take that application packet up to engineering, same thing, three to five days before they even get to it. So we're already past our metric. And then, you know, maybe public works needs to review it, maybe public safety, and then finally building inspections, and then back through the permit text. It's a very linear stage process. Sometimes we would try to get multiple copies of the plans, redline them up, but then we'd have to figure out how to compile those comments and get them to the, the designer to make those changes. Horrifically inefficient. Two weeks easily became four to six weeks, just in lots of time of a very linear process. Um, and then we would have to track down the paper. Admittedly, I lost a permit or two over time. Um, if I turned off my virtual background right now, uh, you would see how messy an office is. So that's why I love these virtual backgrounds in Zoom. Um, so we started to think about this a little bit different. Oh, and before I get to that, uh, stop me when you've heard this before, but we issue a review letter um, that outlines all the comments we've redlined in the plan set. So pick something on a plan sheet. So then we get new plans back. We get a, a response memo from the design engineer. Okay, we fixed it, great. Um, something was lost in translation. So we go back and say, well, you didn't actually fix it or you didn't fix it right, fix it again. Um, and this has all been in writing. So now, wait a minute, we did fix it. I don't understand what you're trying to say. So we got back and forth, back and forth. And sometimes the planner would be in the middle of engineers going back and forth. And there was just this frustration. There is this boiling point of, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what, what's going on? So we would interject and say, all right, let's kind of sit down. Um, let's talk about it in person instead of sending these review memos back and forth. So that gets my point on, you know, I found that 90% of the issues get resolved with better communication. Don't rely on email. Don't rely on letters. Sometimes you just need to sit down and talk through a project. Um, and it's amazing how much that is a breakthrough with a lot of these projects itself too. Just sitting down, understanding the context, maybe discussing different approaches to what we're doing. Um, and I've, I've seen this more often than not solve issues where we spent weeks going back and forth uh, without making any steps forward. So we started to anticipate this and actually build it into the front end of our process. So here's where we started to solve some of our communication and it became a recruitment tool for economic development, not just another step that you have to do in the process. So uh, we try to do some form of pre-application meeting and oftentimes that's a little bit more informal and that's where we just lay out all the cards on the table, kind of schedule the entire process um, we anticipate things that we're getting missed, such as outside regulatory approvals, watershed approval, uh, transportation approval, different agencies that new, need to approve the project. We try to schedule it all out, not to frighten them of all the steps that they have to do, but eliminate that uncertainty, getting back to this as an economic development tool. Next, if the project is large enough, this doesn't need to happen every time, but I've got a case example later on where this was very crucial to keeping the momentum because it was such a big project and it was so complex uh, that we started doing weekly check-in meetings. Uh, the nice thing about this is once you know we have this as part of our actual application process, we charge our time back to the developers. We thought we were going to get pushed back on this, but we didn't. What we did find is if we think about the traditional approach where it was response back, response back, and there was like eight different revised plans. It was inefficient and they were spending far more and more in plan revision than just kind of dealing with this, talking through it before the engineer went back and revised plans. And that's where we start to see the first step of reducing our plan review time by 50%. We still have the planning commission approval, the city council approval, but then the next piece that we saw, started to see was a little bit of a rough transition is the planners are done, now we turn it over to engineering for construction administration. So we would force a sit down after council approval, talk about the contingencies of approval, take minutes for these meetings, by the way, uh, very important to document what we spoke about and talk about what to expect as we formally turn this project over to engineering and that pre-construction meeting where we sit down with a design engineer, the selected contractor, uh, talk through all of the requirements of construction was really important. So yes, we added several meetings to the schedule, but uh, every time we've done this, it's been at the support of the developer. And at the end of the day, they really loved it because they moved a project that had no chance of approval if we did the traditional process to a project that got approval backed by great community support um, and our public engagement. 
So other tools that we've uh, uh, thought about for communication with the public, obviously the pandemic forced us into a whole new realm of engagement and technology and remote meetings. So I'm gonna to try to think about this as there's light at the end of the tunnel on COVID. At some point, we're not gonna be in the same COVID protocol. Um, and we're gonna be in probably a new normal of communication and public meetings. So um, a couple of things we've done um, out of creativity and silver lining to this whole stay at home um, type of environment or hybrid environment is we started using Zoom because we got good at it to just record some quick little uh, videos, sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes a half hour, sometimes an hour. Our community is begging for updates on what's happening in their backyard. We used to do emails and written things. So now we get to have a little bit more fun and a little bit more interaction. Sometimes that's live with our business community. Uh, you see an example here where we updated our business community on a, a Zoom webinar. Sometimes it's pre-recorded that we just get give a staff update, but it's nice to see faces. It's nice to hear from someone where maybe we haven't seen an employee in months because they're working from home. Uh, so we use that as a tool um, in our communication. We do a lot on um, our website and we've purchased a website that allows us to update that without a webmaster, um, a content management system, a web browser is all you need. And so we try to keep um, a project web page of every project we do as a clearinghouse of information for our projects. A lot of times that's nothing more than leveraging the website or the agendas that we have. So we're leveraging other resources without creating a lot of extra work for our staff to update the community on the development projects that are occurring. The newsletter, the typical for a lot of communities, still our number one source of information. And then social media, um, double-edged sword on this one. For a while, we were erring on the side of transparency to sharing uh, project information. Uh, two things were happening there. We were talking about projects that were proposed that ultimately didn't happen. We had a proposed McDonald's that bought property that got site of plan approval, it looked pretty certain. They decided to back out of the project. So for years, we've been backtracking and talking about, you promised us that McDonald's was going to come. Uh, the other piece is, if there's a controversial project, even though we're just reviewing a project, we're not indicating a level of support, um, it's pretty easy to uh, provide a comment on a social media post about the, the negativity around the city and this project that we are reviewing. Uh, so we've put a lot of disclaimers on what we're doing and stating that on the airing on the side of uh, transparency, we're telling about this project that might or might ha not happen and we're very clear on indicating we are just reviewing a project. We have not indicated any level of support. And that's been a pretty easy tactic for us to bridge that gap. So a couple other um, pieces of technology enhancements that we've talked about. Uh, so three big buckets here, uh, remote meetings, and then um, our actually two, just our internal office environment. So we've done a lot of enhancements in e-permits and electronic plan review. Um, and that second piece is also what got us over the bridge uh, to reduce our plan review time uh, by half. So I'm gonna try to do a quick little transition here um, and actually show you live our electronic plan review system, um, which has really been uh, beneficial for us. And so I had a slide earlier on that showed the linear process of stop one, stop two, stop three, stop four. Now everybody gets to look at it on a single plan set all at the same time. We don't have to send it to one plan reviewer or have multiple plan sets going on at the same time. So I've gotten fairly good at Zoom, but I'm not perfect. So bear with me here as I try to um, get my controls back here. I'm going to share the screen here. So what you should see on the screen at this point is our online plan review system. Um, applicants have access to this so they can see live the comments we've made. Um, they can see the status of the project, who is left to be uh, reviewed, uh, when the expected turnaround time is. And so we do this for permits, we do this for land use applications too. Every permit that goes through our door, it goes through the system in some fashion, one or another. Most of the projects are applied online by applicants. The one caveat that we have is for homeowners, we allow them to submit a paper copy, then we scan it in and send it through the system. Um, and it's a lot more self-service. We've seen some overnight applications, like two, three in the morning applications coming in. So um, we've developed a lot of great support. 
not a perfect system. It's got way too many bells and whistles that it needs to, but we use just a small percentage of that. And we talk that through with our developers on the front end as well. So the project we're looking at is Project Docs um, by Evolve Software. And so as you can see here, um, it's just a tool to have all of our plan sets um, and we can mark it up. We can go through um, our review. We can um, approve, uh, deny, ask for corrections. Uh, so much of it is automated that takes a lot of pressure off our reviews coordinator. Um, and so it's kind of a foolproof. So if there is a plan reviewer that says corrections required, the plan, the review coordinator can't accidentally approve the project. So there's a lot of automation uh, to that. It also centralizes a lot of comments and allows us to get those out uh, very quickly. So um, we can show, we can, when we're done with our review, uh, if we're not done yet, and there are some red line comments that the developer needs to address, it goes into one folder. Once it's approved, we have the approved plan set here. And it's nothing more than just kind of going through here um, accepting your task, telling us whether it's approved, denied, or corrections required. So it's a pretty robust system. And as a manager of the broader community development department, I can do a lot of different things too. I can check on the review status of the project so I can see where we are at with the review. Um, I can see if there's corrections required or if it's something that needs to be approved. Um, and then we can um, actually share all of our comments in a report. Um, here's where sometimes the live <laughs> demonstration goes a little afoul. So we'll see if there's any comments for correction. So again, it's just getting the comments out a little bit quicker. Uh, so here's an example of a report that we're able to do that we're able to share with the developer. They can either go through the system and get these comments or often what we do is we export it out and just email it to them uh, as a matter of ease. So it's a pretty simplistic system. Um, there are way more bells and whistles. You know, I think out of these reports that you see on the screen here, um, there might be two. Um, if I were to open up a plan sheet here and show you what a markup looks like, um, there are tons. All right, so here's where I told you sometimes the live um, demo doesn't always work. We'll give it one more shot here. So if I, if I want to make a comment, I just come in here, I do a new change mark, and I say change something. And so it's nice, it's really nice to see it there um, and have it in a concise location that we can easily resolve. So there's a bunch of tools off here on the side, and there's a bunch of sub tools in here. We got really lost in this system um, early on, and we just said, all right, we're just going to use this one change mark tool, and that's all we needed. So a little bit of training up front has really made it worthwhile. So we try not to get lost in the system itself. So I'm going to try to move back into my presentation. I can go back to this, by the way, and do a little bit more detail, but I want to be cognizant of your time here. So. Go back to my presentation, second year. Of course, it didn't pick up where I wanted it to. Bear with me. My apologies. I tried to be fancy and it didn't work. So, all right. All right, now I'm, I'm getting closer. All right, here we go. So again, with that process, we're all looking at it at the same time um, and we're making progress without that linear review process. We're able to reduce the time of our plan review. We actually got more accurate than our plan review. We added plan reviewers to our schedule while still reducing the time. And that eliminated a whole lot of back and forth, tying that back to this being an economic development tool by more accurate, less surprise, less time in our review process. So just a couple best practices, high level. There's a whole lot of lessons learned that I can get into detail one-on-one -on -one if you like. Um, make this a requirement. Don't make it an option. Um, and provide some training. Be that resource. Be that coach. Be that tour guide to actually help them apply. Don't rely on them to do it all. It's a complicated system. It's a tool for staff. It's not necessarily a tool for a customer, although they derive 
uh, benefit. It's there to support, um, not replace. In terms of the requirement, the one thing I will say is should be the exemption is homeowner. If they want to do a deck, a shed, some small project, they want to handwrite it, they want to apply it through paper, allow them to do that. Um, we were doing that still, the paper copy, and even those that were not supportive of the transition early on in our staff, when we hit the pandemic, they wanted us to do all permits um, through the system. So we had some staunch opponents, and it took a couple of us to be uh, champions to get this uh, implemented. And those that were our staunchest critics became our staunchest supporters in the COVID pandemic, where we found a way to get those paper permits into the system. Uh, so we were losing them in the pandemic. We were at people at home, we had people here. It just wasn't working. We kind of forgot how to do the paper process. Um, so it was a really good tool that we expanded and that at the prompting of some of those that were skeptical of this system. The other trap we fell, fell into early on was, well, it's got all the comments in the system. I don't need to call the applicant anymore. Still call, still have that personal connection. Um, if, you're, if you're in the economic development profession, you know that it's part policy, part process, but it's the relationship that you build as well. So this should be supplementing what you've been doing before. This should be a tool for those that want more self-service that opens up your time uh, to be a resource, resource for someone who needs a little bit more of your support. So don't let it be your predominant uh, means of going forward. I know we're, I'm getting close to the 45 minute mark. So I just want to talk a little bit, um, as I mentioned in the abstract for the presentation today to talk about the modernizing of our planning departments across the area, even pre-pandemic, um, but certainly now we're starting to see the benefit of telecommuting and remote meetings, at least in some capacity, because of the pandemic. And now, at least in Ramsey, we're starting to think about what, of, what, what about the current office arrangement sticks moving forward, even after the pandemic. Um, so a couple of things, there's your public meetings, your council meetings, your commission meetings, um, that, that open meeting law. So uh, Minnesota statute chapter 13B governs the open meeting law. Um, literally months before, after two years worth of work, a uh, month before the pandemic, we just finished a new remote meeting policy with our council and commissions. We had a couple of people that were traveling or wanted to pop into a meeting remotely once in a while. It took us two years to get to a point that we were uh, comfortable with that on a very limited basis. So we got to know Minnesota, chapter, Minnesota statute section 13B.02, uh, which is really the remote meetings. It talks about uh, through television. Um, so it's a really old uh, type of statute that needs updating. So there are some parameters that you can hold remote meetings if everybody is able to hear and see the discussion. But then as our attorney walked us through this, he said, well, there's this other section 13B.021, which is an emergency pandemic clause, but don't worry, we, I've never used it. We will never use it at all. Oops, we got to use it. And so that kind of eliminates the need for posting where you are. You can do it via telephone only without a webcam, um, but that really forced some innovation on our RP. So some things we're looking about, we have a hybrid environment right now. Some people are in person, some people are online, uh, and we're able to manage that through Zoom pretty well. Um, and we're starting to think about long-term how this looks. So, you know, council members, voting members of a board are treated in one capacity. Then you have your staff presenting that maybe has a little bit more latitude to use this long-term. We're starting to allow project representatives to join remotely if they want, even post-pandemic. Um, we've had some out-of-state developers. It doesn't make sense for them to fly in for, you know, several hours for 15 minutes of discussion. So now we've proved that it can work. The one piece that we're starting to think about is public. And so uh, we've learned a lot in remote meetings for public participation. So one thing we have, or actually two things we've done is we've eliminated the ability to call in because we're hybrid and we have an in-person option. So it's either online with a webcam so we can have more control over audio visual um, or you're in person. And so we're starting to think about after the pandemic, are we really gonna allow general public to participate in the process online? Um, they can still view online. Um, it's just that matter of if you want to provide public comment live, should it be in person or do we allow this remote uh, piece? And then there's a difference between that public meeting, open meeting law, and then public workshops. We've structured those a little bit differently. Again, finding that if you want people to um, participate live, ask them to turn on the webcam. I'm surprised how many people don't have the webcam on and then we've had a few instances where they were a little bit too bold in their comments. And then we 
found out that they were together with their buddies drinking and were a little tipsy. So that's one of the things that we say, if you're gonna participate in the process, we gotta be able to see your face. So uh, really important for what we do. Um, and then also staff meetings too. So we've gotten really good about Zoom rooms and hybrid uh, meetings. And so I got a couple examples here too. I think you've all seen many of the technology. This is not kind of a critique of any technology other than um, we've become a fan of Zoom and we've become a fan of Zoom webinar that allows our council to maybe be on webcam by right and then the public has to be let into the room. It's a little bit easier to manage when you've got the webinar format of that too. And so this critiques of a few other things. The only other piece is for internal use. We have been using Microsoft Teams because that has a lot of really great collaboration tools on documents and chats and on-demand uh, video calls. So we have a combo of Zoom and Microsoft Teams in our environment, uh, depending on the need. So external meetings are Zoom, internal collaboration is a little bit more Microsoft Teams, and that works out pretty well for us. So I've talked about that a little bit. <laughs> so here's something that I've become really intrigued at in, in the past, even before the pandemic. I was walking the Mall of America one day and I saw this Bank of America ATM and it talked about Teller Assist. And what it was is it was a, it was a bank branch without a staff member there. And I thought, that's kind of cool. I wonder how they make that work. So they were kind of ahead of the curve on this. Fast forward to a couple of years later, there was a Bank of America branch opened here in the city of Ramsey and we were excited about it. And we were gonna go walk and talk to the new tellers that were in the bank branch. We walked in and it's just a vestibule and there was really no one at that branch. And again, it was that same uh, teleconference teller uh, that made it work. The uh, video or the photo on the left is actually from the Mall of America um, and a similar setup again, where they've got this teleconference room where the teller is somewhere else, not the Mall of America, but you can do all of the same business. So. One thing we found early on in this process was we had some people at home, we had some people in the office, and the people in the office were taking the brunt of walk-in traffic when the walk-in traffic needed someone at home. So I tried to do my best of like replicating what I saw here on a, a public budget. Um, and I, I came up with this Zoom room setup. We already had this monitor. Um, I went and did some research and we found this neat room setup. Literally it's called the, the program is neat. Um, and it's a Zoom room that made it really easy for our staff to connect walk-in traffic to someone working from home. And what was nice about it is it's kind of a one-touch deal. So we loaded up everyone in the account, and then on the screen here, um, everyone in our team is listed there. So that all our in-person admin staff needs to do is let someone know that someone's coming into the Zoom room, and they literally just touch the person they need to call and hit meet now, and it connects them versus trying to set up a Zoom link and connect that and all the logistics of doing it the other way, just kind of a one touch way approach. Um, and our in-person admin staff loved this. It took a huge burden off of them, um, especially our permit techs that were here processing permits. Uh, so software was about $50 a month and then hardware is only about 1500. Great investment and something we're gonna keep uh, long-term as we look at a long-term hybrid office environment. So as we come out of this, um, we're looking at the potential, a long term after the pandemic, of allowing expanding our telecommuting policy to three days in the office, two days remote, um, and then having technology that they can do everything that they can do in the office at home. So a soft phone to have their office line at home, a VPN to have network access, portable hardware so they can dock at home or they can dock at the office. And then more importantly, back to the communication, quick huddles on webcam, you can hear, you can see your team members. We all miss being together. Uh, so, you know, these quick little 15 minute huddles a couple days a week have been really important for all of our different divisions to stay connected, to keep that actual communication going. So in the last few minutes, I'm gonna to try to rush through this here. I went a little bit longer than I expected, I apologize. Uh, so a quick case study, single family development that required um, uh, Complete amendments, actually two separate projects that happened at different times under the same developer, uh, totaling nearly 600 lots. Um, and so because it required a Complete amendment, we had some discretion here. If you've never seen the League of Minnesota City's Pyramid of Discretion, I encourage you to look at this. It really helps frame how much public engagement we're gonna do that can influence the design. Uh, so these projects needed a comp plan amendment. They weren't consistent with our comp plan and our zoning code, uh, but they were something that we really liked uh, we thought it was creative, we thought it added value to our vision. Also required environmental review and it was located in the DNR overlay district. So we started asking that simple question, 
Do you want us to get to that finish line? Um, and if so, we will walk you through very methodical steps to get there. Uh, so uh, we went to the council to yes, we want to learn more. We want to hear from the public. This happened at the height of the pandemic, so we had to do everything online. We did a go-to webinar. It was very successful. Uh, we kind of prepped them for what was about to come, kind of trained them on the process, the public that is, and then started getting the nuts and bolts of the development. We built a very high-level, small area plan, just some parameters around um, what we wanted to see that led to a concept layout. And so here's where we started to see extensive public engagement, kind of a bridge between comp plan and pre-plat, that planning framework that turned into an actual concept layout. Started very high level, traditional comp planning, um, the bubble diagrams, the balloon diagrams and land use types that led to a point that the developer didn't have to do a sketch plan or pre-plat that didn't meet our vision and had to redo it. Uh, and the plan looked a lot different at the end of the day. Uh, so the project actually saved a little bit of time in the long run and saved tens of thousands of dollars in redesign because their original proposal didn't necessarily jive with where we ended up. And they're very pleased with the project and they're very excited for where we had. So we built community support in addition to um, saving the developer uh, quite a bit of money. So time is money and no surprises. And so we're just keeping that open line of communication. So I downloaded a lot there. Um, I thought it was gonna have not enough to go through here. So I apologize, I went a little bit long. Um, and I'm going to turn things over to Elise to see if there's any questions that have come through the chat quite yet. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I appreciate uh, your presentation. A lot of great information there. Just to remind everybody, uh, if you have a question that you would like to submit, go ahead and please put it in the group chat. We have about eight or nine minutes. So um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I, I can start with one here. Um, you know, what you, uh, the, the programs you use, obviously they cost, they cost some money to implement. If, um, do you have recommendations if folks um, don't have a lot of funds to move forward with, um, you know, some of the, um, the software tools that you talked about today? Are there, are there things you think that uh, cities and others can do in order to start implementing you know some of the techniques you talked about today yeah excellent question and um you know i think maybe i'll start with kind of the remote meeting software what enticed us about microsoft teams early on was there was this free version there are some limitations to that but at least during the pandemic uh, we could have a way to collaborate on documents live um, and not worry about uh, vpn and a few other things so we did microsoft teams because of that we felt what we found was the limitation is Microsoft Teams is not great at a meeting with a lot of people. It can get bogged down, almost has too much stuff on it. And that's why we did um, Zoom. Uh, so Zoom is great for meetings. Um, and I get the cost, especially with the webinar cost, that's about $150 a month. So if we're gonna be doing a big public outreach, um, we've been able to manage internal um, in our public meetings, kind of with this the standard Zoom, um, that's been able to absorb some of that. But if we're gonna have a, a training seminar like this, um, Zoom will allow you to purchase the webinar software for one month and automatically cancel. That's about 150 a month. So we did that with some of these larger webinars. So that's kind of the online. So between Microsoft Teams and Zoom, just being strategic on who has a license, um, license paid license with Zoom uh, that gives you more than 40 minutes on the free version of Zoom, um, that's what we've been able to do. So we've been able to do a little bit more cost effectively uh, that way. In terms of the plan review, yeah, there's a cost to that. And for us, it's about 30 to 35,000 per year. But we were clearly at a point where we either had to decide, at least, I mean, the building permits were the driver for the online, not the, not the land use application, as that was an added benefit. We were at a point that we needed to add one or two more inspectors for plan review, or we were not going to meet those metrics. And so, you know, we, we've added in one inspector, but, you know, this was about half the price of adding another person. Uh, to do it in the process that we had. So we actually saw that as a cost savings um, and we're able to implement it uh, within um, our existing infrastructure. So yeah, cost is a concern and it's not for everyone, but that, that's kind of the high level overview that I would give. Thanks, Tim. Uh, do, does anybody else have questions? If so, feel free to put them in the chat. Otherwise, we're a pretty quiet group. If somebody wants to unmute themselves, feel free and go ahead and ask that question. 
Oh, here's a question that just came in. Um, is there something, Tim, that you could share that shows uh, what you do charge for? Charge for the software? Um, if the person that asked the question could clarify that, otherwise I would say, you know, uh, how do you, uh, maybe start with how do you charge your, your clients, the developers and who that come in? Yeah, and a couple of things. And I, I realized that when I did the initial after act, I put a little bit more about balancing our staff with uh, consulting planners. And um, the that was a really important strategy too. And in, in the umbrella of how do we pay for this, especially when we supplement with our consulting planners, uh, we really focus our billable time, our development review. So we collect an escrow and we bill our time on any cost to the project to that escrow. Um, and developers are very familiar with that process. They might uh, object to it, or if a business is expanding and they're not used to the process, they might object to that. But for the most part, they're used to that. So we really use our consulting planners at this point to kind of do a lot of the on the ground, detailed planning, zoning review, and charge that back uh, to the process. Um, in terms of how do we pay for, um, the plan review system that's really again generated by permit revenue and billable time and we've been able to show that we can absorb the cost and that forecasted revenue from year to year so it's part of the total package so permit revenue uh, land use escrows are really what goes to pay for a lot of that development review style projects and again we've been able to reduce costs and it didn't actually in the long run add costs if you look at it in the totality um, in terms of like the remote meetings, um, I will fully admit we have benefited from the CARES Act of last year. And so uh, we were reimbursed for a number of those fees. And so um, that's been helpful for us because that was technology that we had to have. In terms of how do we continue this moving forward, we've already started to build it into our budgets here at the city. Oftentimes we have professional services dollars that are a little bit more general. Um, and it's been a low enough cost that we've been able to put it there uh, and, and not reduce our levels of service. Great, we have uh, time for kind of one last question here. Uh, could you spend another minute on the configuration for the on-demand video conferencing that your front office staff use? Yeah, so the on-demand um, stuff, um, really uh, came down to, I looked at Zoom. We found some research on Zoom uh, that helped us through the process. Um, bear with me here, I've got a couple of things going on. Um, and so I was just, to, Zoom's got some resources. They have some preferred um, routes to go um, and what they do um, in terms of software and hardware. And it was through the Zoom website that I found it. So just went online, uh, purchased the Zoom room package, pur purchased the, software, the additional license that went along with that, um, and took it from there. Um, and it was really easy to implement. It's got a Wi-Fi connection, so we just connected to our Wi-Fi here at City Hall and went with it. Um, and it was a great tool for us. So it was really, really easy setup. Just order online, it gets shipped to you, set it, work with your IT to set it up on your wireless network, and there it went. Some of the back-end stuff, you know, with our main account, we just started adding um, our other individual accounts to there. So each staff member showed up on that Zoom room list of participants. Great, thanks Tim. With that, uh, since we have a hard stop here at one o'clock, a uh, thank you for your time, Tim. Thank you attendees for coming and asking great questions. Uh, we will have the recording as well as uh, Tim's slides um, up on the website. And uh, it'll have Tim's contact information, so feel free to reach out to him if, if you have any further questions. If not, have a great day. Thank you.